Christian from Seven Game Network and today's review is a big one. We're going to be talking about the Everrain. Some Kickstarter projects uh, become infamous for a whole variety of reasons, um, but the Everrain is certainly one that became rather notorious amongst its backers and those in the Kickstarter fraternity, uh, largely because uh, it's been a very long time getting here, uh, three and a half years from when the campaign ran and it got kickstarted to delivery. Uh, and in fact, uh, for some, it earned the nickname of the Neverain because it seemed to take such a long time to get here. But thankfully Grimlord has finally delivered uh, and so today I'm going to go through the components of the game, I'm going to talk about the gameplay, I'm not going to go into a rules explanation, there's other videos on the interwebs for that, uh, and in addition I'll talk about who I think this game uh, might suit and be for so that you can decide if this is going to be a game to add to your collection. But firstly, what even is it? What is the Everrain? What type of game is it? The Everrain is an open world co-op experience for one to four players in which you and your fellow mariners take on the roles of captains of ships and their crew, exploring seas full of islands, shipwrecks and hives of scum and villainy, also known as ports. You'll be hiring new crew with special skills and stats upgrading your ship with boomier cannons and specialist modules such as diving bells, brigs and more cabin space for transporting well-paying passengers. But why? Well, the world is filling up with water uh, brought on by the rising of the Undergod and all of his evil minions as he seeks to essentially drown the world. Players will be racing against the powers of watery darkness to, to gather clues so that they can uh, undo the dastardly schemes of the Undergod and pull the plug on his plans. And so with an idea of the setting, uh, let's take a dive into these components. Well, frankly, the components in the vast majority of instances are absolutely gorgeous. I have owned many sort of big box games with deluxe components uh, and I didn't even buy the acrylic order tokens or the metal coins that I could have ordered with this Kickstarter and I have to say that this is one of the most um, satisfying tactile experiences uh, that I've had in board gaming. It's not the most but it really is right up there. The artwork is subdued, yes, but it's darkly beautiful and marvellously suited to the brooding atmosphere. The cardboard stock is serious quality and even the cardstock coins are quite nice and chunky to use. The minis are mostly very good with interesting poses uh, and a decent level of detail. The boats though are the stars of the show for sure um, and there are some fantastic examples of paint jobs being done all over the interwebs. Um, these miniatures really are fantastic. They capture the feel of a boat out on the open waves uh, and they've even got their own little individualized heads as well um, so that you can spot them on when you're racing across the waves in your game. There's a great big bad of the under god um, himself uh, let's just call him Cthulhu, shall we? Uh, and whilst it sort of towers over this saltwater world, it is a, it's a bit of an ugly lump of plastic, really, I, I would say. Um, uh, but it's still a sort of fun thump to land on the table uh, when he eventually gets to spawn. There are neoprene ship mats, uh, one for each of the four different uh, individual ships in the game. And these are really lovely to play with. Uh, they've got uh, the space for you to move all of your crew around and fight monsters that board your ship. Uh, you've got space for the upgrades uh, and for the weapons uh, and to store your clues. Um, and then of course the uh, very nice crew boards sit alongside. Now the crew boards do have some very tiny cards that fit underneath them to give individual crew members uh, sort of individual traits that make them somewhat unique. Uh, during gameplay uh, and that's a really nice gameplay touch 
and the components sort of work, although they do tend to slide around a little bit. Um, but a very minor quibble, because your actual player area, with all the bits you're going to play with, really are wonderful. The dice in the game are spectacular. They, they are gorgeous custom dice. They really are quite special. Um, and that's uh, especially if you manage to get the individual dice packs because they made individual colorized dice for those individual ships, uh, tying it all together. Um, and so uh, those dice really are um, quite something to behold. And man, they, this really adds to that sort of tactile enjoyment I talked about earlier, because these dice are super nice. So whilst uh, the majority it is absolutely fantastic, there was a little bit of a problem with the big neoprene playmat uh, that would be where you put all of the boards as you build the world. It's a sort of modular um, world building. And the big mat, for some reason, they got the dimensions wrong and the world terrain sort of pieces don't fit snugly onto the printed map of the world. Very annoying hurts me right in my OCD. It really does. Overall though, the production of this game, I mean, it really is a joy. There is real pleasure in simply playing with the pieces, seeing your ship develop, getting more cards, getting more crew, um, and trying out all of those different crew as well, of course, um, but simply having that, that real um, broad sweep of glorious components out in this sort of big, bold production is a real draw to play in this game. There's no doubt about it. Okay, so let's talk about gameplay. Man, there is so much good to talk about here. This game does a brilliant job thematically. As I'm playing, I, I, I'm inhabiting my ship. I am going from ports to islands. I'm sending crew members off to do expeditions on said islands. I'm excited about what piece of treasure uh, I'm going to turn up next because even if it's just a basic commodity like rum, well that still has real value uh, and it's great for the crew, the crew love it. Um, the, theme, the theme that is brought to life in this game, um, partly from, yep, some lovely art, uh, partly from some really great writing uh, in the story components, which we'll come on to in a moment. But there is no doubt about it, as you're playing this open world exploration game in this fantastic, lovely, old looking ship that you've got, um, it really does come to life. I can see that sort of slimy, wet, horrible creatures as they climb up onto my decks to fight against my terrified crew. Uh, I can get excited about the various denizens that I'm going to meet as I land at these various ports uh, and the opportunities that might arise to earn myself some more treasure, um, earn some more coin or even just buy some of these exciting upgrades that I can just imagine them fitting onto my ship. When I buy a diving bell and I can get more treasure when I go to shipwrecks, like I can really see that happening as I'm playing the game. One of the things that really contributes to this is there's a sort of story system in the game uh, that's something akin to like Robinson Crusoe in that there will be random events that you will end up experiencing or coming across and you'll have decisions to make from that uh, and that will kind of spawn more cards or more parts of the story um, that you will encounter later on in the game. Uh, this, this works really well. Uh, they weave an excellent thread that all fits and makes thematic sense. The story that builds through each of these um, normally three different cards has a, has a really good arc in that you'll find something and have an in interesting decision to make. You normally have some sort of sacrifice to make. You've got to go somewhere, you've got to pay something, uh, you've got to use up some sort of resource but there normally is a really nice payoff at the end with a good reward, a chunk of money, um, a bunch of upgrades or some of those much needed clue tokens to push the game on. All of the story that is associated with these story cards though is great, really good writing, there's some pretty sort of uh, dark and, and spooky kind of things that happen um, or some of them are just 
kind of what you'd expect, you know, it's lovelorn sailors absconding away from where they should be in the middle of the night uh, and that sort of ilk. It's all gloriously thematic and once again brings this game to life in a very special way. Upgrading a ship is fun, getting new modules and sticking, you know, boomier cannons onto your ship so it can shoot further or just shoot more dice uh, really is fun and makes you makes you feel more powerful. There's also the opportunity to kind of specialise your ship so that you can go for more uh, exploration style upgrades um, or maybe you just go heavily for really nice weapons and you go more of a combat monster. There is some scope certainly in the early to mid game as it exists to manage to craft a sort of particular role for yourself uh, within the team, especially if you're playing you know, two or three of you. So the overall gameplay loop um, of going out onto the open seas, exploring islands, um, shipwrecks, killing monsters, finding treasure and gold and loot and bringing that back to port um, handing in your clue tokens, advancing the game on, buying some upgrades, improving your ship and your crew and then going out and doing it all again uh, against ever more difficult monsters shall we say. Uh, as a gameplay loop it's really intriguing, it's really good fun uh, and it's very satisfying to go through. Combat is fast and, and simple although there's not really much in the way of strategy or tactics I mean you're essentially trying to sort of gang two to one up your crew against the monsters. You can have three uh, miniatures on any node on your boat. Um, and so you're just trying to basically gang up on them and roll more dice than them, uh, which is kind of straightforward and pretty simple. But because the dice are so nice and because the miniatures are so lovely, again, it all just means that the very tactile experience that it is of just getting to gather up your dice and roll these lovely dice and, and read, the, uh, re read the signs on them. Oh, it's just great. And there are several expansions that add more crew, uh, more monsters, a lot more uh, of the sort of story elements, um, which, you know, it really adds to the game. It's giving it a lot more replayability. It doesn't really change, if you like, the actual gameplay loop. There's no big additions to any of that. You know, there's no new sort of big boss to fight against or anything like that. So there's definitely scope for further expansions for this game. Uh, really what you've got is more of the same that you get in the core box. So there's no doubt about it. As an open world exploration game with sort of asymmetric player development in, in your ship. Um, I mean, this is a really solid experience. Okay, so problems with gameplay. Uh, what about the Ever Rain um, was problematic for me and in terms of my enjoyment and whether that really might impact you and what you like to get out of a game. Typically open world games can struggle with pacing. How it is that they can allow you to have this sense of freedom and going around and exploring and doing what you want to do but also moving you towards a conclusion and actually finishing the game. And then what's more, of course, actually designing a compelling end game experience uh, that really does result in a um, fascinating climax that has also traditionally proved somewhat problematic uh, in this genre of game. And somewhat sadly, uh, the Ever Rain struggles on both of these counts as well. Uh, the Ever Rain's pacing, certainly for me and our gaming group, it was a real problem. I have now played four games of the Ever Rain at uh, solo and two and three player counts. And in each of these games, um, which are the Ever Rain is split into three acts, acts one, two, and three, you'll always get to act two, whether you're playing a short, a medium, or even the long game. Um, but you'll need to play a medium game realistically to be getting to act three. Now, there is escalation that happens in acts two and three. Uh, you get some more difficult monsters to fight against and various other things. The challenge problem for me really is that in every single game, Act 1 has really dragged its feet. It has taken a very long time to get to Act 2. Um, and in every game except for the solo game, it was well over the two hour mark and even close to the three hour mark before we were getting out of Act 1. 
Now, of course, some people might say, what on earth were you doing? Well, actually, trying really hard to get clue tokens to advance the game along, because, of course, that is how you advance the game to the next state. But, of course, tied up in this also is the fact that this is a very thematic game, and you have gameplay components, such as the story cards, that part of the enjoyment of the game is reading through the, the fluff, the flavour text, uh, the story, as it were. Um, and if you're playing a three-player game, of course, you're replicating that across three players. Um, and, and so it's these kind of elements that deliberately add to the game. Uh, and, of course, that means they deliberately add to the game time. And, and as I said, the pacing doesn't quite work because for Act 1 it takes a really long time to get through Act 1. And then in each of the four games that I've played, Act 2 happened really quickly. I mean, we're talking around about 40 to 45 minutes. Um, so, in some instances, Act 2 was almost a third of the time that Act 1 took us to play through. So the problem therefore then is that the sort of pacing feels a little bit all over the place, especially as you can play through up to 16 rounds in the long game. I would just never play that because it would take an age. Even doing um, the short eight round game was in a three player count uh, taking us close to four hours. And if you're going to take that to a medium game, then you're probably looking at, well, really easily getting close on to five, maybe even six hours. That is too long a playtime, even for an open world game like this. So, solo or two player seems to be more the sweet spot, I think, for this rich experience that you do want to enjoy. Um, and just be aware that even still it's going to be a long game then. It took me an hour and a half to get through Act 1 when I played solo, and of course I wasn't even reading out some of the story there. Uh, and, uh, and actually the whole game took me um, a, about two and a quarter hours to complete. As a solo, that's not bad. But again, as soon as you're starting to play two or three players, the game really starts to drag on. And it wouldn't be a problem if it was sort of evenly spaced. You know, you had an hour in Act 1, an hour in Act 2, and an hour in Act 3, roughly, generally thereabouts. Um, but as I've said, it really doesn't progress in that fashion. But most frustratingly for my gaming group and myself personally, um, was the sort of anticlimactic... Uh, end game winning conditions. How you win in the Everain is by advancing the uh, player discovery token to the end of the track before the enemies does, essentially. Uh, and how you do that is by gathering the tokens and turning them in at ports throughout the game. You turn in the clues to the university and your discovery track advances. Now, in the four games that I've played, the three that I actually played through to conclusion, because the first game was a bit more of a learning game and at three hours we were still very firmly in Act 1 and not looking at any signs of going any further and we actually didn't finish that game but in the three other games that I finished we have yet to not win and we have yet to not trigger the end game win without even seeing the big boss spawn. Yes, that's right. We have won three of the four games that we played uh, we've won all three of the three that we f played through to conclusion and never once have I got to fight against the big boss, the gigantic miniature um, that is the kind of standout miniature, one might say, from the whole game. So this has left the game end to be turn in some tokens and move the counter along the track and win. That's what we've done. We've moved the counter over and gone, well, well done, we win, and packed away. <laughs> Gloriously, extraordinarily anticlimactic in every way. In fact, what's really fascinating when you think about how it's been designed is that doing well in the game and advancing your player uh, discovery token along the board quickly by getting lots of clue tokens and doing well is a sort of a disincentivizing effect upon actually getting to have a climactic ending. Because if you do that, 
you're much you're not going to spawn the boss at the end uh, and you will win by just moving that token along the track until you get to the end point and you all high five each other in a sort of slightly deflated fashion <laughs> So the Ever Rain's endgame design literally disincentivizes the players to do well through the game if they want to have some sort of climactic ending to the experience. Why on this watery earth uh, it couldn't have been set up so that there is always an endgame boss battle that's triggered but maybe the clue tokens give you some sort of advantage or a, a resource to use in that sort of final battle. Um, rather than this sort of very damp squib ending of just moving the token along. It's a very frustrating oversight of design that really mars for me and my group um, this otherwise marvellous thematic experience. Even the sort of mechanics um, and actually the theme behind advancing the token isn't particularly exciting rather than it being the valiant combat to the, to, to the death and survive at the end of it all it actually ends up being a bit of a smash and grab to grab lots of clue tokens dive into the nearest port and then try and hand in those tokens as quickly as you can to sort of trigger the end of the game uh, quite how that defeats the undergod thematically speaking I don't really know again it just seems like a slightly rushed um, and not so very well thought through and designed part of this experience. Now I do think this is something that is eminently fixable um, either in perhaps expansion content um, because there's plenty of scope for expansions in this game uh, or even just in releasing some sort of you know post-production uh, addendum rule set just an alternative ending rule set um, that would always have this end game proper battle triggered. That would go a long way to um, sort of assuaging many of my disappointments uh, that I have with the game. Um, although, of course, that early game act one really does need some speeding up too. So, all in all, The Ever Rain, it is a lovely production. I mean, with just some stellar components and a beautifully, wonderfully realised, dark and foreboding world to sort of explore through and adventure in. It's just sad that the overall experience is marred by this sort of slightly underdeveloped, somewhat, end game um, and, and this kind of awkward pacing that really uh, slows the game down overall to the point where it starts to outstay its welcome by the time you've been churning away over those seas for several hours. For many people um, who just really enjoy the open world exploring and going to various places you could probably do that for hours and you don't mind about how the end game comes about. If you're that sort of player, I really think the Ever Rain will tick so many of your boxes. I really hope you found this review helpful um, and I would love for you to tell me if you disagreed, if you've played the Ever Rain, what, what did you disagree with, what did you agree with? Um, it, uh, it, it really is fascinating to hear how other people experience their games. Anyway, there it is, the Ever Rain. So until next time, as always, keep enjoying your gaming.